everybody, and welcome back to the Arts at EPCC. My name is Dr. Yasmine Flores, and we are here today with a guest that we've had before, Renee Castaneda from the music department. Hello, Mr. Castaneda. How are you? Dr. Flores, thank you for having me again. <laughs> of course. Very happy to be here. Yes, absolutely. And I told you to bring your friend with you, and you did. I did. Does it have a name? Yes, uh, this violin is named Sarah, actually. Oh, Sarah, I, I okay. named it. I named her after Sarah Chang, who is my inspiration uh, when I was uh, an aspiring violinist. Okay, so wonderful. <laughs> How beautiful. So you brought your violin with you today, mm -hmm. and you are a violinist. Yes. And you've been playing since how, uh, how old? Uh, I actually started in middle school, which is, was rather late. Okay, right. Um, yeah. I actually started in band and trumpet and clarinet, actually. <laughs> I did. <laughs> so I know a lot of okay. big clarinet, as a matter of fact. How funny. Uh, and then I realized, like, no, I, I really love the violin, the, the versatility of the violin. And yeah. then I switched to middle school. Mm -hmm. So I went from honor band to beginning orchestra. Oh, so nice. I've been playing since middle school, so it's a little late start, but yeah, but that's awesome. That's really really cool. So you so about t thirteen or so, on yes. average, mm -hmm. about yes. thirteen mm -hmm. years old when you started, and you've been playing the violin ever since. And when did you realize that music was going to be your calling? So I started my college career at EPCC, as a matter of fact. I started mm -hmm. my basics. I started as a business major. Oh, wow. So I was studying, I remember one day I was in the library at the Vivera the campus, mm -hmm. and I was always listening to the Mozart symphonies, um, mm -hmm. like the standard repertoire, you know, the canon of classics. Mm -hmm. And the one day I realized, you know, what am I doing? You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm studying this, I guess, uh, as, a as a default, you know. Uh -huh. but I was like, well, yeah, I should really be honing in on music. And I always thought I have something to say with music. So I, I decided at that point to major into music instead yes. of business and such. So. Right. Right, mm -hmm. that's awesome. That's really awesome. So you finally realized in college mm -hmm. that you, music was going to be your calling. Yes. And so then you threw all your time, all your efforts into mm -hmm. it, and that's. I think that's fabulous. Now, what is your favorite piece to play on the violin? My favorite piece to play. Um, um I think it would have to probably be solo Bach because okay. of the, the dimension. You know, I think part of Bach's genius is that. He writes for solo instruments, particularly, you know, the cello and, and violin, but he brings so many um, dimensions and mm -hmm. nuances to it for a solo, solo writing. Right. I mean, we have double stops, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, piano, they could do chords and such. You know, we can too. Mm -hmm. So we do have some of that, mm -hmm. but I think that's one of the most enjoyable for the violin. Mm -hmm. Recently, though, um, I think in the last time we met, I was telling you how I, I got into folk music. Oh, right. And uh, about three years ago, uh, right before COVID, um, I was my, my guitarist. He got me into Texas fiddle. Okay. And interesting yes. thing about Texas fiddle is it has roots in medieval, actually. Huh. And, 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 and I mean this in the sense of like the, the heritage of the European um, uh, immigrants mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. A lot of them just knew a lot of um, uh, folk music from European. So it has a lot of the drones. Uh -huh. And if you listen to Texas fiddle, there, there's a lot of drones. And that has the roots in the medieval. How about that? And so I find a lot of Texas fiddle with a lot of dimension. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I find a lot of satisfaction. I mean, it's, it's just so fulfilling, mm -hmm. you know, with because, yeah, we do a lot of double stops. Um, we do what we call um, uh, cross tuning, which mm -hmm. I, in, in uh, academia is a uh, scrollatura, I believe. Okay. okay. Where, where, you, where you turn down the. Oh, yes, scrollatura, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. uh, we have that in Texas fiddle too. So, again, that brings out a lot of dimension to violin. So that's something I just discovered. and. Mm -hmm. Um, so as a classical violinist, um, you know, usually we have a lot of linear stuff. Sure. But again, like I said, Bach and fiddle, it's, it's a lot more um, um, dimension and nuance. So. Right. So let's, let's talk a little bit about all of this because some, some members of our audience will be confused about the word drone. Oh, okay. Well, they'll be confused about some of the terminology and double stops, oh, right? Okay. And yes. what that is. Uh -huh. So explain to me what the double stops are on the violin. So double stops, it's just whenever we, we play two notes at the same time. Okay. Uh, we could play up to three that sound mm -hmm. relatively clean, two very clean, uh -huh. three relatively clean, four we'd have to kind of break them. Okay. You know, e either quickly uh -huh. or kind of just break the chord, you know, two on one, uh, two on two strings and two on the other strings. And now why is that? Uh, the, the way the bridge is, um, again, the older instrument, well, the, 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 the first violins, Mm -hmm. They had a flatter bridge. Oh, interesting. And, and, and interesting. So is a fiddle because it has that heritage. Oh, I you know, see. It, it, it didn't evolve as the classical did. Okay. Um, so 
medieval instruments and folk instruments uh -huh. have a flatter bridge, so you could do more double stops. Oh, interesting. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, just looking at the angle of your instrument, and if you want to kind of point, I'm going to call it the end of the instrument, the, okay, the sure. butt end mm -hmm. to the... <laughs> And so if everybody, yeah, on the camera can actually see how the bridge is curved. Oh, yes. Right? So, and because of that, yeah, you see that curving. That's why Renee or other violinists cannot play more than two notes at the same time. As you're pointing out, if you try to do four, you have to break it in two mm -hmm. and two. Because there's this sort of having to move the bow, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Now, the, the next question, uh, you mentioned the word drone. Yes. So when I teach drones, um, when I talk about it in music appreciation, we're talking about bagpipes usually. Mm -hmm. So we, we, there's a little sack that the bagpipe player squeezes with their arm. They squeeze the air out and then basically the air goes into some pipes. So it produces a constant note. That's what a drone is. Mm -hmm. It's just a constant yes. note. So how do, you, how do you do a drone while you're fiddling? So, in the classical world, usually when we do the drone, it's just with an open string, usually. Okay. Um, oh, it, it, again, interestingly, in the medieval period and in Texas fiddle, they would do the cross tuning. So, medieval has a lot of cross tuning, too. Oh, interesting. Okay. And, and that's something we don't learn, because usually when we learn violin, we learn around the, the Baroque and on. Mm -hmm. But medieval, what we learn... What is cross tuning? Oh, it, it's uh, uh, a scar tour. Right? A scar down... tour. Yeah. Uh -huh. Got it. So, so let me, let's be real okay. specific. So, those pegs yes. that you have at the top, mm -hmm. you can tune them down. Yes. So when you release the tension, the pitch of the string actually goes down, yes. it's mm -hmm. right, it kind of dies down. Mm -hmm. And so I know Bartok does that, yes. for example, yes. our, our piece, our contrasts mm -hmm. uh, oh. for, by Bartok for uh -huh. clarinet, yeah. violin, and piano. Uh, uh, yes. Uh. And, and so, yes, and there's there's times where the violinist has to tune down also, yes, mm -hmm. the Sanson, the mm -hmm. Dance Macabre, yes, right? Macabre. The Dance Macabre also has that score to tura. Mm -hmm. yes. So you're saying that in the medieval times that was also a common yes. practice? Yes, And uh, now, so you're saying open string for the drone. Mm -hmm. Now our producer, I didn't warn him that Renee might play and I'm afraid that I might. Mm -hmm. If you see a shoe getting <laughs> thrown, <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> so, so yeah. So if he wants to play, here's your here's your bow. Mm -hmm. And if you want to show us, I don't know if you want to show us a, a drone, right? While you're playing other strings at the same time. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so let's see. A, a, a drone. Uh, yes. Again, in the, in the classical tradition, mm -hmm. um, it would just be. Um, it'd be just the open string against the melody. I'm trying to think of a piece. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to move your water out of the way. I'm going to carefully, you want to bring your oh, water sure. forward. Sorry, this is all impromptu, everyone. Mm -hmm. There we go. Thank you. Excellent. Good. I don't want us to... We've had a splish splash episode before, <laughs> <No>. Renee. <laughs> Who's who is all like wet and wild here. So if you, yeah, if you want to demonstrate that again, and so you're saying you're going to, when you say open string, what does mm -hmm. that mean? Just the string without being fingered. Okay, so you're not so adding open. any fingers. It's mm -hmm. open. That's the drone, and then you're gonna try to play some other notes at the same time. Yes. Okay. So um, I can't think of the time. So I'll just play like maybe like a little scale. So like just a, sure. a, a basic scale. With a drone, you just play against open uh, string. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Table, sorry. It's okay. Cool. So that, that'd, be, that'd be a drone. Yeah. Um, when you cross tune, you can actually change the pitch so that you could fit the the the, um, the key, and that's why we cross tune oh. for that reason. So because instead of holding down a, a finger mm -hmm. and playing, sometimes it, you know you can't play, you know, fully. So uh -huh. you have to um, you have to tune it down or tune it up. Oh, this so. makes sense. And guitarists do this as well. Yes, they they have. I think. Um, a capo is what they call it, or mm -hmm. capo, mm -hmm. and it, it, it kind of serves as that. It, it holds down strings while it alters it, mm -hmm. so they could do stuff like that too. Okay, so interesting. We don't have cap capo, capo. We just have right. To, yes, yeah. that's true. I've noticed that. Yeah. So that's fascinating. And so now, um, tell us. Let's talk a little bit about the violin. We've talked about it generally, um, but you didn't have your violin with you at the time. No. And so, 
How has the violin ev evolved? Without getting too specific, because we don't want to bore people at home <laughs> with, the, with the specificity of, yeah. of the violin's history. Um, so let's talk about the shape of the violin, because okay. they, going back to Renaissance, medieval, mm -hmm. how did these instruments start off? So I, I believe its origin is actually Middle Eastern. Okay. So during the Crusades, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we adapt a lot of things from Middle East, you know, medicine, uh, right. mathematics, algebra, for, mm -hmm. you know, and this is one of them. You know, guitar, violin is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so the original one, like I said, had a flatter bridge. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a good practice. So I have several violins. Um, I use, um, this one is kind of like my workhorse. You know, I use okay. it for like gigs, sure. outdoor gigs. Now, yeah. I, I bring that up because this one has a middle um, chin rest. Usually, this is actually the original chin rest. Like in, when the, the, during the development of the violin, it's oh, in the wow. middle. Now oh. it's to the side. Oh, yeah. This one just, I just happened to get this. It, okay. it had no designs. I just, I had it, uh, when I bought this, it just uh -huh. happened to have this. So it had this originally, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the older violins. Oh, wow, okay. Um, yes. Or viols, as they call them. And that's the chin rest. Yes, the chin rest, yes. Uh -huh. And then you have the, the bridge, show po point to the bridge, oh, which right we here. were looking at earlier, yes. And then those little toony things at the bottom. So this is a new thing, too. So usually classical violinists will have these up until we get really advanced and we just keep this one. Okay. And the reason behind that is that it, it, it's, it's supposed to sound more, um, a better sound without them. Okay. But I recently put these again because of my uh, involvement in like um, folk music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, instead of drop tuning, saying how to do this, I could tune here. Oh, I see. So it's a lot easier. Okay. So it, they're just tuners. So is, are they more like fine tuning they're compared fine -tuners, to yes. the pegs? Mm -hmm. The fine tuners is what they're called actually. Fine okay, tuners. fine tuners. Fine -tuners yes. Okay, awesome. And the pegs are greater tuning, I would imagine. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like if your violin is literally a half step off, then mm -hmm. you're playing with the peg, mm -hmm. right? Okay, got it. And you have the F holes. Um, how long have those been around on the violin? The F holes, as far as I know, I think they've always existed. They've always existed. I think so. Okay. The placement may be a, bit, a little bit different, but mm -hmm. I think they've always existed. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, because I'm kind of curious, because how did they come up with that shape? Obviously, the scrolls were very popular, um, mm -hmm. Baroque period yes, and uh -huh. prior, right? Yeah. And to include the scroll at the top, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, it's kind of that's something that I've always wondered about. And I then you, they're you just the, decorative. I think they're, they're, they're designed just to be very decorative. Like okay. same with the scroll, it doesn't really mm -hmm. have a, a purpose. It's just decorative. It is decorative, right? Yeah. Right. And that I portion, think I would imagine. They just try that. to make it like as aesthetic as possible. I think. Yeah. And so, and then the the this black portion up here, this is. Do you guys call it the fingerboard? Fingerboard, yes. The fingerboard, fingerboard yes. <laughs> okay, awesome. And now let's talk Stradivarius. Okay. And and which we've talked a little bit about before. So the history of the Stradivarius, if I recall correctly, how why do they sound so fantastic? So last time I had mentioned it had to do with the wood that's growing at the time. Mm -hmm. And then after we had the discussion, I actually fact check myself. And, and mm -hmm. that is the, the common theory, actually, or the, the common uh, belief is. So what it is, just to recap, is mm -hmm. that the wood burn, uh, the wood growing at the time mm -hmm. the in, in Europe, it was during a mini ice age during that, that point. Okay. Or I just, I just got out of a mini ice age, something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So the wood was growing differently, yeah. more robust. And Stradivarius was using that wood for his violins. Right. And they've come so close now. Oh, yes. Nowadays, yes. they've come so close in replicating yes. the Stradivarius. But, but it seems like, because I remember reading an article about this, and it seems like scientists finally realized, because, I mean, they, they, had down, they had it down to, like, a perfect science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, look, we've done the measurements, you know, the width, the length, right. everything. And they finally discovered, they said, okay, wait a minute. It's... Like you said, it's the wood that grew in mm -hmm. Italy at the time mm -hmm. that was from that particular mm -hmm. forest, from that time period, mm -hmm. it created the best violins. And some of those are still in use yes. today. Yes. Millions of dollars worth. Oh, yes. Yes. So, yeah. And so you mentioned earlier you had another violin from, you said, the 1880s. Yes. Um, so like I said, this one's my workhorse. Mm -hmm. I bought this when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. So I, it, it, it takes a good beating. Okay. That's why I use it. You know, I could play outdoors, and it's very resilient. Um, the one I used when I played in the symphony, because I was in the symphony for years, uh -huh. and I had I used that violin. It's a twelve thousand dollar violin. Um, now that one, I had to get a loan to get that one. Sure, of course, <laughs> right. Um, but that one, um, yeah, I, I use for uh, indoor concerts, mm -hmm. and I use this for outdoor things or for just um, something that could take a beating. You know. 
Right, and let's let's kind of describe how because what do we we as musicians know exactly what that means <laughs> um, when the elements are involved mm -hmm. here in El Paso, windy, yes, dirt, yes. everywhere, sand, yes. right, yes, and that affects the instrument. So I mm -hmm. I play the clarinet. It's wooden. It's made of grenadilla wood. Uh, I see a varnish on oh, your yes. instrument. Is that a varnish or a, is that yes an oil? It, it, it's a varnish. It's a varnish. Yes. And so that helps to protect the instrument mm -hmm. as well. Yes. I have seen some clarinets that seem to have a varnish on them, and I'm, I'm always a little weirded out because <laughs> 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 they're super shiny, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's kind of funny to me, but uh, that makes sense because of the elements and especially with the weather here in El Paso being as erratic as it is, mm -hmm. I still can't believe it's still cold outside. The year I graduated high school, which was back in the 1900s, by the way, um, <laughs> uh, was, it was El Nino. Okay. And it was hot in like February. It was like 90 uh, something uh -huh. outside yeah, uh -huh. in February, March, yeah. which was kind of unheard of, especially even, even for El Paso. Yeah. It's uh -huh. hot here, but usually it starts to get hot late April, right? Yes. Uh -huh. It was in the 90s in February and March, which is ridiculous. And, mm. and I remember that about my senior year, I was like, what in the world? We were wearing shorts, mm -hmm. like in, the, in early spring. Mm -hmm. And so now it's like crazy cold outside. Like what? It should be mm -hmm. hot by now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like mad. <laughs> uh, but those elements affect mm -hmm. our instruments. Yes. And yes. so what does, can you tell everybody, like what does the cold and wet weather specifically, humidity, what does it do? Humidity is supposed to actually be good for the violin. Okay. As is cold weather. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Which I guess explains why Europe, you know, it, it, they, it, it took quite a being in Europe, or it, it was more um, adapted to Europe. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't do very well in hot weather, apparently. Because okay. then the, the, the seams start, to, the, the glue starts to melt. Oh, interesting. Or it, gets so, it softens uh -huh. the glue. Yeah. Um, it gets out too. So it's cold weather. They both, hot weather and cold weather both um, cause wood to, you know, for it to go out tune. Uh -huh. But if you had to choose between the two, it's better for it to be in the cold than in the, the hot, the heat. Oh, interesting. So, mm -hmm. so, and this is good knowledge for violinists out there, mm -hmm. for younger children mm -hmm. that are playing violin or clarinet, since we're talking about clarinet. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can tell you, we have dampets. Oh, right? okay, yes, you all that. have dampets, yes, we, we have dampets. Mm -hmm. We buy your dampets, by the way. Oh, do They're you? really for violin. <laughs> gosh, we borrow a lot of things from the violin to include mm -hmm. the rose etudes, right? Know, they're, the all, etudes. <laughs> they're all the um, Fiorillo yes. and uh, Mazas mm -hmm. and all of those Quite etudes. Soon. They're all ours now. Uh -huh. We took them and made them better. <laughs> no, okay. I'm just kidding. You can have them. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So um, when it comes to the elements, I can speak for clarinet. For clarinet, um, Humidity is best, okay. as you mentioned. Yes. yes. Uh, too cold is bad, okay. Because we blow hot air into the instrument, oh, okay. And this expands the inside of the instrument, but the outside is still cold, so uh -huh. that's where you wind up with cracks. Oh, okay. So what's very typical, and I won't say specific brands on clarinet. I'm going to bite my tongue there, but I really want to say a specific brand that gets on my nerves, but <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. The side keys on the clarinet, that is the most sensitive part of the upper joint of the clarinet because um, they, when they pre-drill, they pre-drill the holes. Mm. And so everything kind of happens at the same time in the factory. So when they, when they, that's a lot of stress on the wood when they go in to drill the holes, right? And so it causes that portion of the clarinet to be very sensitive to the elements. Oh, okay. Okay, so the cracks usually happen along those side keys. I'm giving you this information as a former clarinetist that yes. might be of <laughs> yeah. interest yeah, to you, is, right? Um, so, so for us, cold is bad. Okay. We, we prefer like 70 degrees to 90 degrees. Okay. Hot is bad as yes. well because okay. it dries out the instrument, yes. right? Yes. So for us, we keep the dampets, but we're also constantly monitoring the, the coldness of the building. Like if, obviously buildings are air conditioned, Right. If you have a, many of you have these big, beautiful new high schools that I'm seeing all around El Paso, right, with all these bonds and grants <laughs> and whatever, which is great. It's great news. But a lot of those brand new buildings have air conditioning that works really well, <laughs> and so it drops the temperatures in a lot of the storage units down to probably even below 60 at times. And so if you have wooden horns put away and then you give them to the to the students to play. 
you want them to kind of warm up the horn a little bit on the outside before they start blowing hot air on the inside. Oh, okay. So, so that's why I'm kind of asking. I'm very curious about how the violin uh, fares in, in these temperatures. So for both of us, for anything that's wooden, too mm. hot is bad. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Uh, I would I would hate to play my wooden clarinet on a July 4th. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Right? And, and here in El Paso, that's monsoon season. Yes. I was so going to bring that up, actually. Yes, yes. exactly. So we, so younger kids may not know this, but we, we live in the desert, and we have a monsoon season. Mm -hmm. So if you've noticed here in El Paso, come July, this past year was strange because because our monsoon season, I think it was kind of shifted this past summer. Mm. Yeah, I think it was like happening in late August and not so much in July, but it rains a lot. Yes, yes it does. Which for now, I'm, the episode was supposed to be about you, Renee. <laughs> I don't know if you realize this. This is turning into an episode about me. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but, <laughs> but it's like our reeds get uh, squishy. Okay. Does it, what happens to your strings? Uh, the strings? Yeah, like does the, are the strings ever affected? Oh, oh, by the the weather? Uh huh. Uh, I want to say mostly by the heat. Mostly probably. by the heat. Yeah. Okay. I think it's right. I it would. Out. And and are those metal strings? Yeah, we we use metal now. Originally, I'm sure you've heard, you know, cat gut. Uh -huh. You know, I, I think those do still exist. Okay. But now we have the technology where we we've replicated, you know, the cat gut, but into into and it's steel. louder too, right, with the metal strings. I believe so. Actually, I've yeah. never played a cat gut, but I, okay. I believe so. Yeah. I think they're just superior. At this point, they're just a better string. Yes, obviously, so, yeah. yeah. So so I would imagine you're right. And what happens as the strings get hot? Do they go flat or sharp? Uh, I'm not too sure about the strings. I think our most our concern usually is with the pegs in the heat oh, or the weather. Interesting. Because since it's wood, even though it's, it's no longer growing wood, it's still alive in a sense. You know, uh -huh. it's, it's still very much... Yeah. You know, it reacts to the, the, the weather and to, to anything. So that's really our concern. Okay. Um... But yeah, I think the heat does kind of uh, affect it more than, mm -hmm. like, again, like I said, say the cold. Mm -hmm. so. Right. That's And that's really interesting. Yeah, for us, um, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if it how it affects it because I'm thinking of something that's hot is more malleable. Oh, yes. Right? Yes. And since it's, it's <laughs> metal, it's going to be a little bit different from clarinet where if we're hot, we go sharp. Mm -hmm. So then we start pulling out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if, it's, if the instrument's cold, it's flat. It could be the opposite because I, I so. can I can speak for percussion. Uh -huh. Percussion in the winter goes sharp. Mm -hmm. When we're marching on the field, that's the nightmare that we face as the keyboard mm -hmm. percussion, like the xylophone, whatever. If it's metal, mm -hmm. they're super sharp, and mm -hmm. the band is super flat. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and so it's always like ah, yeah. the the band director's nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, so interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting to me. Talk to me about. The bow. Okay, so the bow, um, originally, uh, I'm sure for this too, that, that, that uh, the bow is horsehair. That right. is still the case sometimes. You, okay. you can request horsehair. Uh huh. Um, but now this is most violinists, especially students, have like uh, synthetic hair. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, um, what is that synthetic hair made of? Is it plastic, essentially? Plastic strands? I believe so. Although I, th I think this one actually is horsehair. Okay, wow. Yeah, so, awesome. so some of my bows, I do have horsehair. Other ones, I just, you know, like, again... Um, my, my work, although this is my workhorse, but this one actually is horsehair. Nice. Um, and yeah, so we have to c consistently rosin, or keep it out of the state where uh, we use rosin. So what rosin does, mm -hmm. it serves as a grip okay. for, for the violin. So without the rosin, you'll be slipping everywhere. And um, oh. yeah, so, so we use that as, to give it grip. Okay, and, interesting. And we're discouraged for touching the, the hair because if we do, we risk getting um, oils from our hands or water, anything we have in our hands. And that will um, upset the hair. Oh. So we try not to touch hair as much as possible. Interesting. I have noticed that, that you mm -hmm. all are very particular about, yeah, keeping your hands off of that, mm -hmm. off of the horse hair. And so what is the, what is the price range of these bows with horse hair? Um, so again, horse hair you can request. Oh. So if, if you're at a, a violin shop, you can request a, a horse hair or synthetic hair. Okay. Um, again, this one I did request horse hair. Mm -hmm. um, vi uh, bows themselves, um, this one I got for, I think, was 700. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I, th I think it got a price for 900, but I, got, I bought it for 700. Okay. Uh, because of the weight, it's a very light bow. Oh, That's nice. That's why I got it. Now, beginning bows are student vi uh, bows. I mentioned last time, student models now have come away a, a long way so that they actually sound really 
good. You know, there, yeah. there's some student vans that I think are really, really good. Yeah. In fact, I like to use them for gigs sometimes, like outdoor mm -hmm. gigs. Yeah. Um, so a student violin, I mean, you could, I mean, student bow, you could get from like, I guess like thirty dollars. Oh, Even nice. twenty dollars, yeah. And You're right. Now that I think about it, mm -hmm. I had to buy an emergency bow one time for a student, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I ran in. I just grabbed whatever they mm -hmm. had, and so yeah, it was about that price range. You are right. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. So so a student could rent a violin and mm -hmm. then have their own bow. The bow would be about thirty dollars. Violins are a student model. Mm -hmm. How much are they? Right now, the student model, um, they can. I, I think that average between two hundred to about five hundred. Okay. For a student model. To purchase. Yes, to purchase. Okay. Uh huh. Awesome. Yeah. And that's and that's very helpful for people mm -hmm. to know because um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of parents out there that are probably thinking, oh, I want you know my mija mm -hmm. or my mijo mm -hmm. to play violin mm -hmm. in the orchestra, and so they're thinking they're kind of wondering if they should rent, if they should buy, mm -hmm. um, and it's honestly. The student models are nice as a backup. Mm -hmm. And I wish I would have kept my student model clarinet mm -hmm. because I, when I was young, many moons ago, mm -hmm. um, I used to just sit my clarinet on the peg and I would come back to it and practice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Periodically, yes. practice a few scales and then go back to my homework, right? Yes, Whatever uh -huh. it was. Yes. And the bad thing about a wooden horn in doing that mm -hmm. is you're le leaving the water condensation on the inside oh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and the wood wants to expand. And here we go again with the cracks, yes, right? Uh -huh. So for us, it's nice to have a student model. It's plastic, yeah. it's polypropylene, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, oh, okay, this isn't going to get ruined, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so if a student is serious and they do want to continue to play the violin, maybe purchasing that student model and they mm -hmm. can use it as you said their workhorse mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. which means that they can play it outside the july 4th mm -hmm. concert yes, whatever yes, it yeah. is 9 11 mm -hmm. and the elements won't affect the instrument so much yeah awesome or if there's some major damages it's not as big of a hit as a thousand dollar plus violin you know right i mean god forbid there's damage you know but exactly um a couple of years ago i was uh -huh. involved in uh, viva el paso uh-huh and i was playing uh I I was a, a fiddling cowboy. I was seeing all this stuff outdoors. Yeah. So I bought a student model violin. I think it's a Chichilio um, mm -hmm. brand. Mm -hmm. And I bought it actually on Amazon. It was, I think, a little less than 200 as a matter of fact. Okay. And it was pretty good. It was pretty decent. I mean, it got the job done. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it withstood the elements, you mm -hmm. know, and I bought for that specifically. You know, I, I bought just for, you know, I could be out in the canyon, the canyon you know. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it did the job and That's got the work awesome. done. That's so. awesome. Renee, before we go, mm -hmm. I want to tell everyone yes. that you teach violin here at EPCC, yes. and they can take with Mr. Castaneda, yes. that is MUAP 1201 and 1101. 1101 yes. is the half hour and 1201 is the full hour. So take a look at Web Banner when you're registering for your courses, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Castaneda, thank you for so much for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me again. It's such yeah, a pleasure. Of course. Thank yes, you. thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us again. Take care. Bye, everybody.